So uh, this uh, particular session is going to be presented by Dr. Bill Muir. Uh, Bill Muir is a professor of genetics at Purdue University. His research focuses on genetics and genomics of animal behavior with the goal of improving well -being, the well-being of domesticated animals. He has also developed a methodology for biotechnology risk assessment of genetically modified organisms, providing government agencies, industry, and environmentalists with objective assessments of risk for the protection of the environment while promoting responsible use of biotechnology. Today, he will present a talk titled The Science and Science Fiction of GMOs. With great power comes great responsibility. Uh, so with that, if you would please silence your electronic devices. Uh, this is Daughter Doom, so don't put them away. Go ahead and, uh, uh, if you will, uh, we'd love to see you tweeting to the hashtag Daughter Doom. Uh, posting to Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, whatever social media you are uh, part of. And if you would please welcome me and uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Muir. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, it, it's, um, it's one of those, this is one of those talks you don't want to do at night because you're, you're going to have problems sleeping tonight. I guarantee it. <laughs> so it's going to be more about the doomed than the dawn. Although I'm going to start with talking about um, all the wonderful innovations that can be done with such technology, but then really my job is to what are the issues, what are the potential problems, what, what can go wrong with this technology. So I, I delve deeply into that and looking just at the title. I just want to see the demographics in here. Does anybody recognize the quote? This, this quote here? Ah, oh, that's three, four, five. Who, who made it? Oh, close. Who? Spider-Man, you said right there. So Spider-Man himself was a GMO. <laughs> Spider-Man made that. He, he was very powerful, but he, he recognized. Actually, it wasn't Spider-Man. Um, he, Uncle Ben, Uncle ben. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, um, you're right. Um, so leading into this, um, my research, as you, as you heard, really um, is looking at the risk due to G GMOs. I uncover risk. And um, in the past, you know, this, this, the aqua vanished salmon has been on, on our plates or you know, attempting to be on our plates for over 25 years. And most of that delay, most of those 25 years was actually to address the ecological risk. It wasn't food safety. It was really what is the concern if fish get loose in our environment, what's going to happen? And how do you regulate that? And my early research, um, I came up with a, I, a uh, using population genetics, um, I detected a theoretical risk that was later known as the Trojan gene hypothesis. And basically what that said, if a, a new GMO were introduced such that it had sexual prowess, in other words, that if you made a genetic, genetically modified organism and it tended to get most of the matings, that a gene with a low fitness, a viability fitness, could be driven into a population due to its mating success, because we all know it's more important to mate than to reproduce, that if you could get all the mates, you could pass on bad genes. And a bad gene was one, is, is a gene that you know, perhaps couldn't, side, couldn't survive the sexual maturity. So survival of the fittest is only one part of Darwin's equation. It only deals with survival from the juvenile state to the adult state. But even more important, what drives evolution, and ev all evolutionary biologists will tell you this, sexual selection is more important in nature than survival of the fittest. And if you have a conflict between those two things, you can drive bad genes into a population and drive the population to extinction. So that was why it was called a Trojan gene. It looked like something good, it turned out to be bad. But the nice thing about that is that um, once we know the risk, we can determine how to manage them. In other words, I knew what to measure. Measure mating success, measure viability. So I came up with a methodology called the net fitness uh, methodology that allowed um, companies, regulators, to measure a set of what we call HACCP criteria. This is hazard analysis and critical control points, such that if you measured this, you could predict what's going to happen with reasonable uh, certainty if one of these get loose. And uh, using these methodologies, we actually finally were able to look at the uh, alcohol-advantaged salmon, and we found out it was a dud. 
that the females didn't like it at all. Uh, it had no meaning success. We, we thought that because of larger, the women would like larger fish. Because, well, if you're large, you must be more successful at gaining food and beating down predators. So that was the reason for the theory, was that large males would get more matings. Well, it turned out that the male was actually couldn't do the dance. The dance is the mating dance, and the dance has to do with display, look how great I am, look how good I am. You know, and you have to display lots of vigor. And without doing that, he couldn't get any mates. So he, he had a double whammy. He didn't survive to sexual maturity as well as the, the non-GMO, and he couldn't get any mates. And as a result, if one of these gets loose, it's just going, nature's going to purge it. Like nature purges any new mutation that's not fit, it quickly drives it out. So this, this methodology, uh, because it, had, it, it allows you to measure these things in a safe, secure environment, uh, is now used by the FDA in terms of what do we measure to determine environmental risk of these things. And it's turned out to be very useful. So it, it played a role, actually, in getting these salmon, although they hated me at the first, then the people who were, who were producing these GMOs, they really wanted to market it. And when I came out my Trojan gene, they could throttle me. Uh, but later, it, it came to their rescue because once you know, the data is the data, you know, get rid of the, don't worry about, you know, all of the, the hype and all the concerns that the data tells you what the concerns are. And so I, when the data turned out to be that, you know, they didn't have any meaning success, I was the first to go to the FDA. I testified to the Veterinary Medical Advisory Committee in Washington, D.C. that these things do not present a risk. There's not going to be any Trojan genes and they're okay. And so that helped greatly in, in, in actually getting, getting these uh, technologies, you know, to market. So uh, just finding the risk, knowing how to deal with them, is, is how you can get you know, mark things to market. You need to address the risk and the concerns. The same methodology was used to look at glowfish. These glowfish here are um, the, this is the, these were actually the first genetically modified animals to be sold on the market, to be allowed to be sold. They've been on the market for about five or six years now. You can buy at Walmart, Petco, PetSmart, um, a lot of people think they're injected with something to make them look like that, but it's actually a gene that's been transferred from coral, from sea coral. So sea coral comes in a lot of different colors. We move that gene from sea coral into these fish, and now you have fish in living colors. And the, the goal was is that, you know, the only fish with color that is really beautiful are saltwater fish. And saltwater fish are difficult, nearly impossible to maintain for long periods of time. So now they made a freshwater fish that's as colorful as the saltwater, and it actually rejuvenated the aquarium society. And this, this now is its own segment. This, the, the, uh, the glowfish actually sells as many tropical fish as all the other ones combined. So it's become a huge marketing success. And again, we, we use the net fitness methodology. Every time they come up with a new color, they send it to me and I say, well, do these tests. We look at the data. And I said in a letter to FDA whether or not this is more fit or less fit, and they're almost, they are all less fit than, than the wild type. And then the FDA, FDA approves them. Um, so I, I want to first acknowledge the benefits of genetic engineering. I mean, seriously, it can potentially cure or prevent cancer. Um, it can cure inherited diseases. If we, put the, if we use these technologies in humans, it can he heal things such as hemophilia, muscular dystrophy, Huntington's chorea, all devastating diseases. We can increase food production in an ever globally expanding population. This is, this is like what the, the aqua advantage salmon grows, grows twice as fast and is more feed efficient. So we can feed more with less, less inputs. So this is, this is what we mean by feeding a global society. Um, we can improve animal well-being. I'll show you how that one of that's possible. And more in your mind recently is Zika virus. We can control mosquitoes and the spread of mosquito-borne uh, diseases such as malaria, dengue, and uh, Zika. So I'm just gonna, gonna say these technologies are all given. I, I believe in them. I think they're wonderful. And if we don't have all the technology worked out now, we will soon have it. So I'm just saying, the, I, I feel this is a given if not now, it will be here in a few years. And I embrace it, I think it's wonderful. But, so what is not to like about the technology? Every technology has positives and negatives. So you need to know the risk. Sometimes they're hidden. It's like the Trojan gene. You would have never known that it existed unless you did the population genetics to figure out why it could be a risk. And once we determine what the real risks are, we can manage them. How do you manage them? Well, either you don't do it, you get rid of it, or 
you know, you do other mitigating circumstances. Usually, if we find a risk with the technology, as a business, the first thing you do is trash it. Say, I'm not going to do that. Let's do something that's not going to give me regulatory hurdles. Because, you know, company is out to make money. So uh, this has been a great boon to, to companies to determine what should they go forward with in terms of marketing. So there's actually been, so the game was fairly stagnant. I'll say it's been stagnant for maybe 15, 20 years where we all, ha we were doing uh, GMOs through random insertion. We would insert some DNA. We would hope it get randomly inserted in a genome. We hoped it would produce something. And you usually ended up testing three to 5,000 embryos before you got, you know, finally the one that worked. But then came along this thing that was called the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. This changed the entire game. What these are, <laughs> you have to know what CRISPR is, just, just so you see it once. They're the clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Does that tell you anything? No. So how did it evolve? It evolved as a result of a bacterial defense against viruses. So how does something like that help us make GMOs? Well, the answer is, is that if you think of things that are larger than you, they may be a predator. So what's the difference between a predator and a prey? When, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're small, you're a bunny. If it's a lot bigger than you, it's probably a predator. If it's a lot smaller than you, it's probably a parasite. So in terms of a virus, it's much smaller than you. So a virus is probably a parasite. It's not going to be a predator. It's pro probably going to be a parasite. Bacteria learned to remember the genetic codes of viruses that attacked them. Can you imagine that? a bacteria learning something? You know, it's, it's almost unimaginable. How did bacteria figure out how to remember the viruses that attacked them? What they did is they remembered the DNA or the RNA of the virus that attacked them and kept a piece of it around. And so if I see anything like this, I'm going to shred it. I'm going to see that same piece of day, and you get your shredders out, and you just cut it all up in small pieces, and it goes away. So it was their defense. It's, it's much like our immune system. You know, we, we adapt quickly to new, new viruses due to our antigen antibody system. Bacteria don't have anything like that. This is their equivalent of the antigen antibody uh, uh, system. Say, so, well, how does that help us? Well, what it does is since it recognizes the DNA, um, we can use that because that's just exactly what we need for precision, precisely inserting genes in GMOs. So what we do is we take some target organism and sequence it. So here we have the DNA. We're bringing over here. This is this is old fashioned kind of sequencing. But the idea is that we, we had peaks that would come off and tell us what the there's four bases of DNA, the, the C, G, A's and T's, and these peaks would tell us what, what was the next base in the sequence? And so this is typically how a sequence was done oh, about 10 years ago. This is older technology, but it's a lot easier to, to comprehend. Now we're using what's called next gen, which uh, sequence small fragments. It's, it's somewhat the same, but um, uh, we no longer use these, these sort of things, but same idea. And then suppose that we knew the gene that we wanted to target. I say, this is the gene for reproduction, or this is the gene for an antibody or an antibody response. I want to knock it out. Well, I know the sequence of that gene now because it's been sequenced, and I want to insert something right there so that I can disable that gene. It no longer functions. Well, how can I do that? Well, this new CRISPR technology recognizes exactly where that break with the sequences and where to cut. And so this Cas9 is what's called an endonuclease. An endonuclease just means that it cuts nucleotides, but it cuts it specifically at a very specific region, and it cuts it in two. So now we have two pieces up here and there, and uh, it's an exact cut, exactly where we want it. And the interesting thing is then, oops, go away. Um, it's what do you do with a cut piece of DNA? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. You can let it repair itself. Usually when, when DNA repairs, a lot of times there is an, there's a random insertion that it, that's inserted in there, usually a two base pair insertion, or you can put a new gene in. So let's just do what we call a non-homologous end joining of these two pieces, they go back together, and you usually will get a small insert uh, of something. N, N, N means any base. There's any of the four bases, it doesn't matter, just insert something. And what that does is when this is transcribed into RNA, when we, we translate then that sequence into uh, the amino acids, it's translated in terms of triplets. So the tRNA comes in and translates this, this DNA, but when it gets up to here, Previously, the triplet that was encoded for was an AGA, and now it's an ANN, and the next one's an ACG, and, the, and now it's an AAG. 
What that means is that all of these amino acids, once it hits that point, they're all wrong. For, so what it was encoding for, all these amino acids is encoding for all wrong. That means that you've, you created a frame shift. And this frame shift essentially produces a gene knockout. So you can very easily knock a gene out simply by knowing where to cut it. Cut it someplace that you know, knocks out the functionality of that gene and the gene will no longer work. So um, the neat thing about this is that not only is it precise, it's an all-purpose technology. It can be used for virtually any sexually reproducing species, humans, rabbits, pigs, mosquitoes, anything that sexually reproduces, we can use this for it. So what doesn't sexually reproduce? Well, bacteria, viruses, you know, things like that. But nearly everything else in life that's diploid, we can use it for many plants. You can use this in plants too. Um, we can target any gene sequence anywhere in the genome. We know the genomes, we know the human genome sequence. That was done five years ago. Now we can cert, we can random, we can we can gene edit any place in that genome because we know its sequence. It's easy to use with direct commercial access to the technology. So let me show some applications that have already been, been done, have already been demonstrated. These are examples with swine and cattle. And swine, this is really cool. So swine has a problem with what's called PERS. It's, it's a porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. This is a devastating um, problem for, this is too close. This is a devastating problem in, in swine production because there's no vaccine. There's no way to cure. You can't give a shot for this. They, they have no vaccine to stop PERS. So the way, way you, you stop it is once your herd gets PERS, you kill them all. And you clean the whole place, you disinfect it, usually leave it vacant for six months, and then you repopulate. There's no recovery from PERS. So that was the only cure we had, is, is you know, the, old, the old adage that the way you, CDC stops spread is you isolate and you let it die out. So what was done was it, when the virus enters the pig, it actually attaches to receptor. So all viruses need a receptor. They need, they need to know where to land. And what they found out is where it landed is in a gene called the CD163 receptor. Once it lands there, it reproduces and it kills the pigs. So what they did was essentially they produced a knockout, a CRISPR knockout that knocked out the CD163 receptor. No receptor, no landing. That virus could no longer infect the pigs and the pig is perfectly healthy. So here's a way of working around vaccines. You can't make a vaccine for something, well why don't you just try knocking out the, the receptor? And this worked beautifully. And they're now, now trying to use this in pigs. It's commercialized. We're trying to get FDA approval. I think, I think they will. Because as all we did, is all this CRISPR technology did, is not, a, we haven't used transgenics because we haven't moved any gene from any organism to a new organism. Is all we did was produce a mutation. So mutations happen all the time in a genome and is all we did was made a directed mutation. So pig doesn't need that? CD no, no, it's perfectly fine without it. Yeah, it, it, the only thing it's for is that virus. So here's another example. We can use this technology to eliminate need for animal mutilations. So we mutilate animals. It's, it's a very big animal well-being concern. We mutilate them to control vice. Beak trimming and hens to keep them killing each other. And we also dehorn. Dehorning is a bloody, this is, so horns are removed on cows because they're dangerous. They kill, they, you know, they can kill their handlers and they can inflict injuries on others, other cows. So normally what happens is they're born with their horns and this poor calf was dehorned, and it's a bloody, painful surgery. Nobody likes to do it. People like them, you know, the calf doesn't like it, and the handlers don't like to do it, but you end up then with a cow <laughs> that doesn't have horns, and now it's safe. So what we did instead was say, well, we know that there's breeds of cattle without horns, like the Belgian blue, the gene for hornlessness, called polled, was sequenced, and we know the gene sequence in Belgian blue, and say, well, we'll clone this, and we'll use a Casper the CRISPR-Cas9 to actually move it in to Holstein cow, and now we can produce Holsteins without horns. You can actually do this by classical breeding. I could breed, breed this cow to that one, and then I have to back cross that one to Holsteins for about 10 more generations to get it back to Holstein, because you're crossing a beef cattle to a dairy cattle, and I want a dairy cow, I don't want a crossbred. So you have to back cross and keep back crossing until you get your original breed back. That would take about, with a GM methodology, the CRISPR-Cas9, we can do it in about five years. Conventional would take about 50. So sometimes there's a need for speed, and this allows us to 
introduce allele that's very desirable that's in one breed into another breed. So it's very fast and efficient. So here's, I'm gonna delve now into concerns. Um, what if we apply this to humans? So I talked about you know, applying this to humans to cure genetic diseases. And actually, there's been research already done in humans to determine if we can make GMO humans. You know, can we apply this to humans to um, address diseases, genetic diseases? And that's an admirable goal. But then, you know, there, the, the whole the reason for doing this was actually to employ this, CAS, this CRISPR-Cas9 in for many other applications in humans. What other applications? Well, this is where I have my concerns. When they're using hem human embryos, there's actually another group that's doing this now. While they're trying to perfect the techniques, many of these embryos are gonna die. These are viable embryos. Many are gonna die before they can find a way of really getting this to work in humans. Killing embryos, a lot of people consider that an ethical issue. Um, also, there are some unintended side effects. That is that once we do this CRISPR-Cas9, I said it was very targeted and we knew exactly where it's gonna go. That's actually a small lie because there might be other places in the genome that actually look like that site, and it may go there and there and produce the same effect. We don't know all what we call the off-target sites. We'd have to ensure there's no off-target sites. And if there's off-target sites, then we essentially may create a new condition that's maybe even worse than the old condition, and further, the risk of the technology, the risk of these modifications are borne by those who had no say in the decision. So the, the idea of informed consent to do medical um, interventions require you to consent and to be fully aware of all the risks that you're entailing when you, when you have this. But if your children, you know, haven't consented, but, you know, you can consent for your children, that's okay. But how about your grandchildren? How about the children 10 generations from now? You had nothing to do with their life and you're making decisions for them. So there's an ethical concern that those who haven't had a say in the, in the process, you know, made the decision. So there's an ethical issue there. Finally, you know, the one that comes to everybody's mind is designer babies. Um, you know, we're on a slippery slope here. We're losing it, we're using it to knock out genes that produce diseases. Well, while we're at it, what if I want to make something, you know, I want to be blonde. I want to have blue eyes. I want my children to have smarts. And we actually know the genes that produce smarts. So now we go in and produce children with high IQs. Question is, well, is it ethical? But Beyond that is who would benefit? Who could do this to their children? Would it just be rich people? Who would pay? I don't think insurance companies are gonna pay. And finally, if we did all this, there's a cost to society in terms of what is normal. You know, if you have an average child now and everybody else has had their kids all crispered, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, wow, are you a negligent parent? Why didn't you produce a genius? Um, so, it, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of ethical issues that, are, that we raise when we start talking about editing humans that, you know, you have to deal with the entire society. We can't just, just stop at looking at, oh, we'll, we'll cure these diseases. Think, think beyond uh, just the diseases we're going to cause or, or cure because, you know, people ought to make money. And when there's, there's money to be made, they're going to use it for any place they can make money. So. <clears throat> We're producing GMOs using the CRISPR uh, technology. In the previous examples, this required manual insertion into an embryo via microinjection. That is, that here's, a, here's a needle, and it's injecting into the nucleus, and it's injecting into their, the, the gene that we want. Um, and the, 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 what we call the Cas9, that's the endonucleus, and the SG RNA, these are the synthetic guide RNAs that tells it exactly where to cut. These are injected in solution, and each each time you make a genetically modified individual, you'd have to go into the nucleus and um, do that, and, and so it's very laborious. But gene drives, there's this new thing called a gene drive, and a gene drive actually combines the two genes together, it combines the Cas9 and the nucleus with the uh, synthetic guide RNA and puts it into a cassette. And it inserts this by mic microinjection as usual, but now it directs the animal's own genes to replicate this cassette. So you put the replication machinery into the animal, and it's not only gonna replicate it, it automatically duplicates it onto the opposite chromosome. So what you've done is you produce an instant homozygote. And in genetics, we talk about a gene, you have a heterozygote, it means that it has one copy of it. 
And if, when you have offspring, you, you'll, spread, you, you'll send this gene to one. If you have 10 offspring, five will get one copy and five will get the other. With this technology, what happens is that if your parent has one copy of the gene, it converts it to two and all of its offspring have two. So in other words, it eliminates the other allele. It makes all into one. So here's the example of two beginning one. So we have an example of the, this is the uh, modified fly mating with a wild type and it passes its, its gene on to one individual, doesn't pass it on to the other because on average it, you know, it spreads to 50% of its offspring. That individual mates with another wild type and it's, it, it you know, spreads it on to 50% and so on. So in terms of time, there's a constant number. This, this, this new mutation stays at a constant frequency through time. It, it's um, um, not increasing or decreasing, it's just staying constant. Now here's what happens with this, what we call this mutagenic chain reaction is that two begets two. So here, here is a individual that's been modified and it contains a mutagenic chain reaction now. When it mates with wild type, all of its offspring contain that and both copies. And when that mates with wild type, all of its offspring contain it. And when that offspring mates with wild type, all of its offspring. So you can see that the number of GMOs is increasing geometrically, the power of two. So within two years, you take two to the, you know, they, they generate every two, every 10 days to two weeks. In two years, two to that number would be every fly in the world. It'd be, a, it, in other words, it would spread through the world in two years. Every fly would have it. The question is, what do they have? Well, it could be a gene package that could prevent transmission of a plasmodium causing malaria Zika. Hey, that's good, right? That, that's fantastic. That's what we want. Or it could be a gene package that caused a population to self-destruct. In other words, it's something that could cause, uh, it interferes with the reproduction or it interferes with its viability, and the population cycles down and self-destructs. Well, you can still say that's good because what you're doing is you're getting rid of mosquitoes. And who likes mosquitoes, right? So it's self-destructing the population. So maybe, maybe either one of those is good, but that's essentially what you can do with that technology. It drives the, pop the genes into the population. But now this mutagenic chain reaction um, raises some concerns. I say, well, what are the risks and what do we need to do? Well, it kind of reminded me something about other chain, where have I heard chain reaction before? And where I heard it from was nuclear fission. And it's exactly how you do fission. You know, one nucleus hits another, it pops apart. Those two molecules pop apart. And you have eventually an uncontrolled, right, chain reaction. Sometimes it's uncontrolled, or you can control it in reactors with carbon rods. So what do they have in common? Well, mutagenic chain reaction and fission are both chain reactions. That's a given. It turns out both can be used for great good, or it can also be used for great evil. On the other side, what obstacle does one face in application of gene drive versus nuclear fission? What are the obstacles of adapting these technology? Well, one technology, I'll let you guess which one it is, requires great expertise, specialized equipment, regulatory hurdles, and access to a restricted raw material to use. The other one does not. None of these things are in place for using this technology. So should I worry? <laughs> well, I worry. Why? Because, well, one is ease of access. I told you it's easy. These came in my email last week. Applied stem cell. They say efficient, affordable, one step gene editing. Um, save effort and time. Gene uh, experts are ready to help. How about transgenic rabbits? Would you like this with the CRISPR Cas9? I can make a transgenic animal model and deliver one live to you tomorrow. Or if you want to, want to do our science fair project? We got a do it yourself kit. All right? So, what kind of lab do I need? Well, I probably need a pipetter, you know, maybe a few other things, but. Really, if you, if you just have moderate level of lab, lab savvy, I can do this. I can do it actually in a high school science class. They wouldn't have enough, enough of the tools, petri dishes and what have you I'd need to do this. It, if I, ha I have the company that's doing all the hard work for me, that's all I'm doing is I'm just doing the final step. I have a concern with eliminating mosquitoes. Um, I hate mosquitoes, but if you stop and think about it, um, if we release this to control mosquitoes because we want to control malaria, um, and you eliminated them, if you look at all the things that feed on mosquitoes, it's actually bats, birds, tadpoles, turtles, spiders, and most juvenile fish feed on mosquitoes. They actually, you know, 
They're part of the ecosystem. They're needed in that ecosystem. These animals, these animals and terns, these you know, birds, <laughs> turtles, spiders, all fish, they control other insects, or perhaps they even feed somebody down here. So if you, if you eliminate something from the ecosystem, it may come back to bite you. In other words, be careful what you ask for, you may get it. And what you get, you may not want. Um, so I grudgingly have to say that wiping out a species, even mosquitoes, is probably a bad idea. It'd be a better idea to just alter the mosquitoes such that it cannot connect, carry the plasmodium that causes malaria. In other words, there's a plasmodium that mosquitoes have that they transmit. If we can just keep the mosquitoes from transmitting that, well, that's good. I don't think there's anything that lives on plasmodiums. So I, I think that's where we should uh, focus on. Um, there's been co some concern about spread of these things from country to country. They said, well, what if you make this in the United States and it spreads to South America, or it spreads to Africa or someplace else? You know, these things can, they have legs, they have wings, they can move. How do we, if we make this technology, how can we keep it from impacting other countries? You know, because now we're a global world. Well, some people have come up with the wonderful idea of, well, we can manage these risks by targeting the mutagenic chain reaction to polymorphisms present in local populations. What that means is that we are all different. We all have what we call SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Down here, for instance, is an example. Uh, in Brazil, we have a mosquito and its sequence, it has an A in this right here. And in Africa, the same mosquito has a C right there. Everything else is identical except for that one base. That's called a SNP. So the idea was is we could target the mutagenic chain reaction to wipe out all mosquitoes in Brazil. And even if they go to Africa, they won't affect the mosquitoes there. So therefore, we've limited the risk of spread. This is all great and grand and dandy, but what else can it do? My question is, is another name for local population is race, right? Race is a local population. And what limits that idea to mosquitoes? So what's a new way of bioterrorism? You know, think about it. You know, I'm thinking about horrible things. I think, wow, you think about bad things. Somebody got to think about the bad things because you have to pre you have to get ahead of the curve. You have to. You just can't be reactive. You have to be proactive. So now let's enter the twilight zone. And there's this wonderful quote from Mark Twain that says, "Truth is stranger than fiction, because but it is because fiction." is obligated to stick to possibilities, truth isn't. You have to read that two or three times before you, before you finally figure out what it means. And what it means is that, you know, if you're writing a sci-fi book, you have to write something that's plausible because otherwise the readers say, oh, this is insane, this won't work, everybody knows it's nuts. So you would never write a science fiction book with something that's not plausible. Fantasy fiction is different. The science fiction supposedly has a scientific basis that's logical. Well, who would have ever thought that you can, that a bacteria could evolve to remember how to cut up viruses that attack it and cut it at exactly the same place every time and pass that on to their children. You know, that's something that we would have never anticipated, something that we would not have thought of. So that's what he means by truth isn't obligated to stick to the possibilities because it, nature can go, it keeps testing things. Nature tests things all the time with random mutations. And sometimes it comes up with really ingenious things that we would never think of. She keeps trying. So in the in, in Twilight Zone now, could, they, there's, there's been people thinking about that. There's papers out in uh, science um, talking about, well, you know, there, we don't need to worry about this because of the following reasons. Some have, I say some, these are these authors, suggest that risk is limited to species with short generation intervals, like mosquitoes and flies. But humans, we, wouldn't, we don't have to worry about that because they say a, dri a driven alteration would be only four times as abundant as non-driven alterations a full century after the birth of an edited human. In other words, I produce one edited human, it takes 25 years to make offspring, 25 years to make next, 25. So he's, say, he's saying that it only, it's only four times faster. Of course, he's wrong, it's eight times because he got the mutagenic chain reaction doubling every time, so it's two to the power of four. They're thinking about linear. On the other hand, I say, what limits the number of initial individuals edited? Is it microinjection? If we have to do microinjection, sure, that's very laborious. I am thinking, why should I limit myself to microinjection? Why not enlist an agent? Matter of fact, we enlist that agent all the time. 
um, known agents are retroviruses. Exactly what retroviruses do is they incorporate themselves in your DNA. We have lentiviral vectors, we have adenoviruses, and in fact, in 2008, there's a publication on production of transgenic farm animals by viral vector media gene transfer. We know how to do this, it's been around for a decade. And in fact, many of the methods used for, or proposed being used for uh, gene modification of humans to address gene therapy is a virus because now we're talking about addressing a human and we need that modification in every cell. We're not just talking about the offspring, we're talking about the individual itself. So what if I do that? Well, that would be pretty, you know, then, then I can spread it just like a virus. And so now I'm not only spreading it like a virus, it's in, it's in your DNA. And so then all your offspring, once that virus is gone, will we'll contain that modification. So what other horrible things can I think of? Well, one of the things I thought about is that, can you put a fuse on these things? What do you mean a fuse? Well, a fuse is something that you put on something so you can get the hell away before it explodes on you, right? Well, in the case of something I want to spread, what if I want to spread something? When you talk about a lethal pathogen, like say, why isn't dengue or many of these other really bad pathogens, why haven't they wiped out the human race? Once you get them, you know, you're dead. Why haven't they wiped out the human race? Well, the answer is very simple. They're so damn hot, they burn themselves out. They can affect local populations, but once that local population is isolated, it can't, you know, it kills everybody. Everybody's dead. You can't spread it. So the, the more hot a virus is, the less it spreads. So it, it's mainly contained because it, it's so virulent. So the way to get a virus to spread is what's called attenuation. And most viruses know how to do this. They say, well, I didn't get very far being a real bad virus. I only infected 100 people. What if you know, some of the people I infect, I let some of them live? Oh, I can spread a lot further. Well, maybe I should just keep on taking this idea and let the people live and keep on spreading it. And what you end up with is a common cold. This is a bad virus that attenuated itself to a point where it spreads really easy, but doesn't kill a toast, usually. So that's what we mean by self-attenuation. So what if we learn from nature and we created a sterilizing genetic modification with a fuse? What I mean by a fuse? Well, it's something that activates only after blocking sequences are deleted. In other words, this gene will not, will not produce any, anything until it shortens to the point where the blocker is missing. Well, how do I do that? Well, I can use another CRISPR that what it does is it cleaves three bases each generation. So let's say 10 generations, I can tell how many generations I want it to go off. I say, oh, I want 10 generations. Why? Because I want it to spread to everything and everybody and then it activates. Well, what does it activate? What does it do? Well, what if it sterilizes you? You're no longer able to produce children. Well, how do you know that? Well, but a year later, they'll notice nobody's coming to the hospital with children. And a year later, they'll say, oh my goodness, look what we have. Oh, everybody has it. You know, it's a problem. So what, why haven't we anticipated this problem? Let me take, <laughs> that's not scary enough. Let me talk about X-Men. So could we, could X-Men be possible? So you can tell I've been watching lots of television. I went to lots of sci-fi. So what is an X-Men? An X-Men is a person, these are, these are mutants who have special powers. Well, what if I want to create an X-Men? And what power does, that, does he have? Well, this particular X-Men is immune to a newly created toxin X. So I make a nerve toxin. But I engineer this, this X-Men to bypass, create a bypass, such that this nerve toxin doesn't kill the person with the proper gene. In other words, it knows how to detoxify it or route around it. And so you could use this on a battleground, all your perfect warriors would be immune to it without gas masks and everybody else would die. Does it sound like science fiction to you? Here's the example. This is an example already in existence. Because all we gotta do is change this from plants to animals. So what you have is, is Roundup, which is glyophosphate. This inhibits the enzy enzyme EPSPS, which causes plant death. They found a microorganism called SP4 was found to be resistant to this glyophosate inhibition. So they cloned the SP4 into soybeans. This then became what they call Roundup Ready plant. We would call it the X plant, right? Because after you, here's, here's a field with weeds in it. Here's a field sprayed with Roundup. What survived? Well, all the weeds died because they, didn't, they weren't Roundup Ready. So this is what Roundup is. This is why we use it on our fields because we have X plants. They're all Roundup Ready. 
So that idea can be carried over to anything, right? If we wanted to use a technology to make us immune to just about anything, we could. So managing risk. What we need to do to manage risk is to identify potential problems, analyze how likely they are to occur, take action to prevent this risk that you can avoid, and minimize the ones you can't. Sounds reasonable. So how do, we prevent, how do we prevent this mutagenic chain reaction? This is where I'm most concerned about. The first thing is to avoid what we call the risky cassette. That is the, the uh, split up the gene drive system. Right now, the, the, the mutagenic chain reaction occurs because both of these things are put in together. So why not put them in on separate chromosomes? So I can put in the Cas9 and the nucleus in this chromosome and the guide RNAs on that. You've taken apart the chain reaction you'll still get some of the same effect. Um, the Cas9 gene will segregate independent, so they're on different chromosomes, so that they, they, they will segregate independently, which means that with time, natural selection will, will remove one or the other, and it'll stop the chain reaction. What it means it's not as effective, but that's great. We don't want it to be as effective. We'd like to control it. So you re-release it every two or three generations until you get the de degree of control you want, and then you stop doing it and then it goes away. So this is a way of controlling that chain reaction. Um, the second thing we need to do is active monitoring. Active monitoring of what? Well, we know what this CRISPR-Cas9 technology looks like. It does not exist in nature naturally, except in, in haploids. We know what it looks like. So what we need to do is what's called eco-sampling. So as a pro proactive measure, if we want to know there's some bad guys out there doing this, rogue nations, doing crazy things, you have to anticipate it. You do what's called eco-sampling. You sample the environment, sample the mosquitoes, sample flies, sample, you know, do sampling. And what you do then is you bring this old technology back to, that created the problem, and you do what's called metagenomics. You sequence everything out there in a sample, and you see if it aligns to the reference genome sequence. We know the sequence for Cas9 and CRISPR. Among all the stuff I sampled in the environment, does it look like this? So we, you know, the human genome sequencing is, is quite common now. You can get your genome sequence for $1,000 right now from the same company that will send these other things. Science, Science Connect will sequence your genome for $1,200 in 60 days. A lot of people will get their genome sequenced. And if this sequence appears, we'll know something's afoot, right? So I don't think that this is really going to happen in the sense that we won't be caught unawares because we know what it looks like and so all we need to do is be vigilant. People are going to be sequencing, and we just need to keep looking for, is this thing out there? The other thing we need to do is anticipate. We need a think tank. We need to assemble multiple disciplinary teams. I was at a talk, you know, the talk yesterday by uh, the person designing the X project. We need people who think a lot worse than I do. You know, they're a lot smarter, and they, they, they really know they're nefarious, and they can think about how, develop worst case scenarios. What is the worst possible that we can do as technology? I'm sure there's things a lot worse than I thought of can be done. Get them to think about it. And once you can think about it, then you can, you can manage it. You can develop defenses for it. You know how to, how to handle it. So what is, it, what is a possible defense? You got the disease. How do I get rid of it? Damn, there's this CRISPR in me. Are we done? The answer is no. There's actually something really cool. So once detected, so I have a, a, a mosquito coming in, and, and this little scissors and DNA means it has a CRISPR-Cas9 in its DNA, and it's, it's invaded the local uh, mosquito populations, and we didn't know it was there, but we equal sample and we found it, and it's gonna come wipe out our population. How, what do you do? Anti-CRISPR. <laughs> so, so any edit, any gene edit can be overridden. So that's a nice technology. So you bring in your, your anti-missile missile, <laughs> and your, your, what you bring in are your other mosquitoes that you've genetically modified. It reverts, it, it reverts back to the natural sequence, and it has a mutagenic chain reaction in it, and it reverts back everything to its original state. So you can keep on doing that. And the nice thing is that, well, if, if this is happening in your local area, you can release a lot more than an invader. So yes, you can control this technology, and there is a defense, but you gotta know what to defend against. So, in conclusion, much of what was discussed is currently in the developmental stages. Maybe it will remain science fiction. 
Nevertheless, we need to remain vigilant because with great power comes great responsibility. And I wanted to acknowledge those who to help help me present this talk. Natalie Van Hoos uh, from the Ag Communications, she, she greatly helped me frame the discussion and editorial assistance, very, very important. Uh, Dean Jay Ackridge, colleague of agriculture, actually requested that I present this. He's gonna be sorry. And Mitch Daniels, president of Purdue University, for encouraging us to ask the hard questions. I'm not sure if he was anticipating one this hard, but nevertheless, the purpose of Dawn and Doom is to look at not only the upsides, but the downsides. So I really delved into the downsides. What is the dark side? Once we know the worst, then you know, we've known the worst and we know how to handle it. So questions, because sometimes I'm even afraid of what I think of. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes for questions. I know there's going to be a lot of questions, so I'll try to take a couple from each side at a time, and we'll get to as many as we can. Hi, very interesting presentation. I wanted to ask about the Roundup Ready soybean plants. Yes. Um, Mark Hyman, who's a famous physician who writes a lot about health and wellness, he is very suspicious of Roundup Ready soybean plants and is advising people not to eat products that are made with them, which I believe is the majority of soybeans in the country, and I wondered if you could comment on that. Yes, um, I, I would tend to disbelieve that individual because um, there's nothing in the trans gene itself. It's just a, it's, it's a, a gene that was found in a, in a bacteria that allows a bypass to this particular in inhibitor. I see nothing in the construct whatsoever that should cause any food safety concerns. Okay. Now, what, what they may be concerned about is the glyophosphate itself, you know, the, the Roundup itself. Some people have argued that it may have health hazards be, by having it sprayed on the plant. But again, nobody has ever found, you know, they fed this thing 10 times, 100 times the, the recommended dosage, and we can't, in lab rats, or having, have never found any consequence of, of, of feeding, of eating Roundup, or of eating plants that are Roundup ready. So, so I, I just, basically, I don't believe it until, if, if, if it were true, I would expect that the regulators, the FDA, EPA, would be on it, like, now, you know, because that, that's their job. And if, there, if there's anything to that, they would d be doing it. Thinking of the porcine uh, disease in swine, where the non-genetic uh, remedy was to isolate the population and then eliminate the affected population. <coughs> uh, thinking uh, also of man-cow disease, that was a big deal about oh, 10, 10 yeah. years ago. The same non-genetic remedy was applied in yeah. Great Britain and England and right. big scares in Canada. Right. Has genetic technology been applied to that <coughs> disease? That's a fantastic question because I proposed doing that 10 years ago <laughs> to Purdue University um, and showed them that I can knock out the prion. If, if you don't have a prion in you, you can't get prion disease. So eliminating the prion keeps you from getting prion disease. So the, the prion disease, which is mad cow, is precipitation of the prion in the brain. And it's like Alzheimer's. It eventually uh, makes plaques in the brain. But if you don't have it, you can't... You can't um, transmit it, or you, can't, you cannot uh, get it. So the, the obvious way of, of stopping prion disease is to breed cows that have a natural knockout in the prion gene. And uh, it, it'll work, it'll work perfectly. I do not know why anybody hasn't done it yet. Um, the reason we didn't do it at Purdue is because we couldn't patent it. So what happened to mad cow disease? Just go away naturally? Um, my guess is yes, because they, they know what to test for. All the veterinarians know what to look for. You know, in, in the abattoirs, they look at the brain. You know, they look at it very carefully. It's still there in terms of your deer populations. They, they have an equivalent, somewhat equivalent. You can get um, the, the same sort of disease, not quite as bad as mad cow from deer. So if I'm human and I like venison, I possibly, or handle venison meat to deer brain, yeah. I could uh, get infected. Yes, you could. Uh, Crutchfeld disease, I, I can't remember the exact name for it, but uh, yes, they still have it in deer. Absolutely. It's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the risks. I talk about a food risk. At, at the last presentation, you heard about all of these bacterial 
you know, food risk. Well, this is a non-bacterial. Prion is actually a protein. It's, it's one of the non -life, it's, it's, a, it's a disease caused by a non-life. Uh, it, it's not a virus, it's not a bacteria, it's actually a protein. And what happens is that abnormal protein comes in and it causes the other proteins to change shape. And then it's a chain reaction. It's like nuclear chain reaction. All of them precipitate. Once they see this altered form, they all precipitate. So once you see the first abnormal one, it spreads through the body and, and precipitates all the proteins. say an invasive species, so like the Asian carp that are in the yeah. northern, uh, are approaching the Great Lakes. Right, so th this is one of the really great um, you know, thoughts. I mean, like, like I, I showed the example of the rabbit. Rabbits are the, the greatest invasive species of Australia. I mean, there's lots, everything invades Australia, and, and trying to get rid of these things is, is like, you know, they're, they're, they've been trying forever to get rid of these things. Asian carp is a really good one in the United States, uh, snakehead. We have lots of invasive species, and certainly it could definitely be used to get rid of them. There's no doubt that you could, you could invent a CRISPR that would get rid of any invasive species in your country. The concern is what happens if it gets out of your country and goes back to the country of origin? How could you ever guarantee that it wouldn't happen? And if it goes back to the country of origin, is that now are Americans liable <laughs> because you know, they made it and it went to their country and then it's part of their ecosystem? And well, you know, the Chinese really love Asian carp and now you got, you've done away with their food. So the unintended consequences are always, you know, the short, the short, the short sightedness of let's get rid of this because it's a problem. So we unleash our nuclear bomb on them, and oh my goodness, it went around the world. It's sometimes they're just too, too draconian of a solution. That releasing a technology that can wipe out a species to me is something that probably, except if applied to a bacteria or, or a virus, I would never do. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a really good point. So if, if you warn the, 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 the receiving country that, oh my God, be on the lookout for a CRISPR that we released in our population, you need to release the anti-CRISPR and, and overwrite if it invades. Yes, you could potentially do that. Or you'd basically do it yourself, go over to that country and mitigate. You know, you have like an oil spill and I, I, gotta, I gotta clean it up. Yeah. I've you, got another question. Yes. So, um, I'll bring the mic over in just a second if you don't mind. Uh, yes, yeah, so and a follow-up to this gentleman's question about mad cow disease. Um, say you still st still do get infected by a prion. Is there any way to reverse the misfolding of proteins? No, no. W once it starts, there's no known way of reversing it. That's that's the bad. There, there's because it spreads throughout throughout the entire body very quickly. Well, um, I, if there weren't any ethical or regulatory hurdles, I would say it could be done in two years, yeah. three, three max. Is there a good chance that people can avoid some of those regulations by saying we have the technology to do this, it's not right that we don't give these people a normal, healthy life and just try to deal with the consequences of unethical, you know, procedures Yes, um, that's true. So w the only way we have to, it's not really, we could try to regulate it and just make it against the law to do it. Of course, that's not going to work. Um, <laughs> so the, the other way that we, we tend to manage it is that NIH has come out and said it will not fund any research associated with gene editing in humans. So you, if you can't get funding to do the research, it's usually not going to happen in the United States. But there's already other countries that have, are taking, you know, have done this uh, recently in the past week with normal human embryos. The embryos I, I pointed out were actually uh, tripolar. They were, these, these were embryos that wouldn't live anyway, but they're actually using embryos that was discarded by fertility clinics. They're, they're perfectly normal embryos. And as well, they're not gonna use them. We might as well use them for something. 
Um, and so, you know, if they proceed, and the idea is, their idea is that they, they are going to develop it for treating uh, diseases in humans, Tay-Sachs and other Lou Gehrig's, things that are inherited. They, they feel that it's their moral right to uh, let people have normal children. Uh, now, we're talking about genetic diseases that are transmitted to children. The, the corollary to this is what we call gene therapy. Gene therapy is where we apply this technology to individuals. And I, I have the disease myself. I have Tay-Sachs. I have something. And I need it cured. Uh, I'm not talking about not sending it to my offspring. This is, this is called gene therapy. And that, that's been used um, for over 10 years. Unfortunately, um, one of the cases that it was used in, it, it, um, it was used on four individuals and it cured three and it killed the fourth. And the fourth that it killed was actually a normal healthy teenager. And it turned out that they, they, he was given a, a large dose of, of the, uh, the virus and uh, it, it, he had an extreme allergic reaction to it. Well, this individual didn't tell the NIH, who was funding it at the time, that actually monkeys had died from this therapy and didn't report it. And he also didn't report that he actually had a company that was going to commercialize it. And so they found that they ruled that this is, this is all of what informed consent came about from, was this one particular case. Because the individual did not, and their parents did not realize that actually fatalities had occurred as a result of applying this, did not disclose he had financial interest and covered it up. So now, you know, the whole world of regulations has come down on this and we're very ginger. It stopped, it stopped gene therapy for 10 years. So we're just now starting again looking at gene therapy under the new regulatory guidelines. So it's going to, it's going to take a while for that to progress. I think, again, it's going to go, go forward, but a lot more slowly because, you know, harming humans, is, you know, we can't, it's, it's really, you got to be very careful. Um, talking about commercialization, we've all probably read that Monsanto just got exclusive rights to use CRISPR uh, in agricultural applications. And I'm curious what you think about uh, whether, kind of what the pros and cons are of consolidation and limiting the use of some of these technologies to, you know, the few giants or kind of allowing them to be more free range? Well, you're asking a very broad question about really uh, patents and how broad patents should be and if patents are a good thing or a bad thing. And um, um, that's, that's a huge debate. I, I generally feel that, that patents are a bad thing um, because of it tends to limit. On the other hand, I can argue on the hand, other hand and say, well, if companies didn't make money you know, off of things that they could keep the secret to, they wouldn't make, make it. So if you're a capitalist, you have to love patents. But you know, if, you're, if you want to spread the technology quickly and easily, you hate patents. Now, this doesn't stop some countries. So some countries view a patent as wonderful because you know exactly how to steal the technology. Really, so a lot of people will not patent a technology, they keep it as a trade secret because not only will it no longer be patented in 20 years or whatever it is, but you, unscrupulous nations can't take that technology and duplicate it because when you make a patent, you tell exactly how you do it. You give them the recipe. Yeah. So you were talking about <clears throat> well, a couple questions, but there was how you were reducing the problem in this pig and then you this country will have their, you know, their anti-CRISPR technology. But from what I've seen with our ability to just manage transgenics in places that want them and don't want them, it seems like it'd be a big fat mess. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. That's the answer I was looking for. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. But, but let, let me let me finish oh, answer, answering yeah. that a little more detail. Is it's it's a big fat mess because, you know, I'm not saying that that we this should be something that we, we should release and say, well, when it gets out of hand, we're going to you know, manage it this way. I just, there's certain things you just shouldn't do. You know, I'm, I'm saying this is what you would do as a last case scenario and somebody did something that, you know, in their lab, th this is gonna happen. You're going to, somebody's gonna make one of these mutagenic chain reactions, Drosophila, and it's gonna get out of the lab because Drosophila is gonna get out and it's gonna spread. Now, how are we gonna stop it? So the, the question is, is how are we gonna anticipate and manage when the unthinkable happens? And this is for the unthinkable. So what is the current global regulatory landscape of managing CRISPR? Who's doing what? And are they all getting along and seeing eye to eye on everything? 
no. <laughs> no. Um, there, there's, there's fights over the patent, who patented it, who invented it. Uh, as I understand, there's still, that's still in courts. Um, there's three, three groups that came forward and said they invented CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And I don't know if the courts have settled yet. I, I don't follow the legal too, too closely. Great, that's probably all the time we have. We'll have to make some room for our next guest. So, uh, big round of applause for our.